Around the country, in Texas, California, Colorado, there was a whole new movement, and they called it the Chicano movement, that was going into the high schools uh, to motivate students to want to improve their education a lot. And walkouts, blowouts, were uh, happening, and particularly in Texas and California. Student organizers from Arizona State University and Phoenix Union High School were motivated and inspired by national events like the Vietnam anti-war protests and the civil rights movement led by the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. They were demonstrating against academic discrimination and racial injustice. Mexican-American students were forbidden from speaking Spanish in the classroom and on school grounds. And they were being pushed to pursue trades, not college. As a young man, uh, I was very proud of who I was from an ancestry standpoint. I was Mexicano, I was very proud of being a Mexicano. My parents, uh, my food, my music, uh, just the whole cultural aspect of who I was, was, I was very proud of. But I never really saw the inequities uh, that I was facing, because you have to remember that if you live in a barrio, <laughs> you're all the same. To recognize discrimination, I would have had to have gone outside of that. And I didn't really recognize it uh, for what it was. And when these students, these people, uh, some of which were the founders of Chicano School like Alza, came onto the campus not only to motivate me to want to go to college, but they also began to talk to me about uh, how things were not equal and what it is I could do uh, to, to make things better for our community. And they were very simple messages that really combined well with, you need to get an education, young man. And the reason why you need to get an education is because we have lots of issues in the community that need to be dealt with with people who have educational backgrounds. And that really inspired me. At that point, I started realizing, hey, wait a minute, they're right, you know. We don't have enough Latinos at college. We don't have people, are, our, our kids are dropping out. And um, we have been discriminated against, and I didn't even realize that. As the 70s began, Chicanos por la Causa began championing the concerns of farm workers. Many of CPLC's leaders were the children and grandchildren of farm workers. They had first-hand knowledge and many times experience what it was like to have to travel with the seasons, working from crop to crop. It's only when Cesar started talking about the working conditions. We worked 12 hours a day for as low as 60 cents uh, an hour, seven days uh, a week. And so it's very difficult and under every condition, weather condition uh, there is. The farm uh, owners oftentimes uh, did not care about uh, the conditions. Cesar lived, lived here uh, in this room in Santa Rita Hall, which was the first building uh, and office of Chicano por la Causa. And this particular room is where Cesar Chavez had his 24-day uh, fest. The Santa Rita Center was a small chapel built by parishioners of the nearby Sacred Heart Church, east of Santa Rita, in what was known as the Golden Gate Barrio. The neighborhood roughly bordered 16th to 20th Street from the railroad tracks to Buckeye Road. The people in the church of Golden Gate had evolved over decades and generations and had begun organizing the people to improve their community and those barrios nearby. Chicanos por la Causa's role in the Chicano movement began to grow in numbers and strength because of the synergy with the Golden Gate community and its parish. It was the beginning of a strong partnership fueled as their barrio grew in the shadow of the city of Phoenix's growing downtown. In the 70s and 80s, the city declared eminent domain and began raising the Golden Gate neighborhood to expand Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport. It displaced nearly 6,000 Latino families, leaving behind only one prominent red-bricked symbol of resistance.